My laptop did what many laptops before have done for me. It died. It died in a really spectacular fashion, and in a way where my attempts to bring it back were utterly unsuccessful. That laptop lived a long time, so I thought I'd give it a small eulogy and just think about the fact that I depended on it so very, very much. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Jeff Atwood, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. It was around 2013 that my previous laptop died on me. I don't exactly remember what ended it, but it was probably something involving the actual physicality of the machine. I would have remembered a drive failure. It was probably a broken keyboard, a strange reaction on the USB, an inability to function properly that probably represented the end of life for this machine. I mentioned it on Twitter, and to my delight, I was offered a new one. The benefactor just asked me where I wanted it sent. I told him, and it arrived. An Asus laptop, touchscreen, all SSD, which felt, at the time, like a whole new generation of laptop for me. Previously, I was pretty committed to having the largest screen a laptop could have. Literally, 15 or 16 inches wasn't enough. It had to be 18 or 19, to the point that my laptops felt more like artist portfolios than any kind of machine. Some of these were so heavy to lug around that they would represent a majority of my carry-on weight. So it was a bit of a turn to get used to a machine that had a relatively small screen, was flat in every sense of the word, and had an extremely unresponsive keyboard, one that felt more like a chiclet keyboard gone supernova than anything else. But it was free, it was here, and I began using it. Like a lot of laptops, it had quirks. The left USB port wasn't powered, but the right USB was. It was running a very strange version of Windows 8. And at the time, the solid-state drives made everything run faster than I'd remembered. A lot of laptops are top-to-bottom compromises wrought in tiny squares, with screens less responsive, keyboards barely doing the job, and a mouse pad that you either adapt to or lose functionality in your hands. This machine, in other words, was going to take some getting used to. But what started out as a forced partnership quickly became something very, very functional. I found this thin laptop to be just what I needed for going from one place to another and actually using the laptop pocket in various bags and knapsacks. I was able to throw it into the back pocket, not think about it, and fill the rest of the bag with whatever I needed to stay over or spend a night. It had a full HDMI port, and more than once, it was my machine for presentations. There are easily 15 or 20 talks I've given where this small square is sitting behind the podium or even up on the top of it, giving me my cues for what I'm going to talk about next. It outlasted multiple mouse clickers that I would buy and then proceed to lose. There's a certain size of equipment that appears to elude my keeping it safe for any period of time. I've lost external mice, external USB hubs, and of course many, many power supplies. It almost became a joke for me that every single trip I took going with this laptop meant that the laptop was coming home, but the power supply wasn't. 
I was a literal Johnny Appleseed of laptop power supplies, various countries, various hotels, in the bottom of podiums at presentation stations as I desperately wound the cord around trying to get my power working for the talk. There were so many of these things in my past. Luckily, I determined that the power supply was very, very generic and could be bought for under $10. Over the years, this laptop took on multiple guises, multiple duties within my life, but it settled really on three. First, as a presentation machine, a simple computer I could put up on a podium, connect to an HDMI, give it a USB mouse clicker, and give a presentation not having to think about it at all. It became a repository, really, for all sorts of slide decks and images that I thought I would use in presentations. It also became my very dependable recording studio, a machine I could put on the seat of my car when I was recording podcasts there, or sitting on a shelf next to me while I had a microphone running to it. The relative quiet of the machine, especially when plugged in and not given too much to do, meant that it could be used in all sorts of recording situations and not get in the way. The third thing I was using it for was editing. Whether I was writing something or recordings being cut down, it was perfect for that. I learned how to move my hands around in a way that the small keyboard didn't bother me at all. I could do Vegas video editing, Audacity editing, whatever it took, and wherever I could find the time. While desktops with massive screens continue to be how I do productivity best, this was a dependable sidearm. I could open it up and then start working immediately. Regardless of what it seems like to some people, my productivity comes in stops and starts. I've had days I've lost, hours that had to be thrown away, simply because of a technical issue or losing the thread of what I thought I was going to do. Having a portable machine a few feet away that I could immediately open and start working in was a gift and a treasure. My first laptop was an IBM PC convertible, a machine I had in the late 80s that was so strange looking that actual teachers I had in college thought it was some sort of cheating device more than something somebody would actually use at a desk. I have memories of flipping that thing open and having the other students look at me with the same combined confusion and fear as if I was running a Geiger counter over the room. Here I was bringing this bizarre, massive white box, putting it on my tiny desk, and then filling the room with the sound of typing. Of course, the world caught up to this approach, but it was those early moments that made me realize that this was a place unto itself for me, a place that I was working in that was for me. And if I was going to get anything done, I was going to have to ignore the world around me and what they thought of me doing this. Like I said, my laptops were massive, huge affairs from that point on. They had fans and noisy drives and represented bringing a small idling vacuum cleaner into rooms that weren't built acoustically to make that sound go away. Laptops worked best for me when I was working hard alone and needed one more screen on the desk. From that point then, when this machine arrived, one I wouldn't have ordered on my own, I realized what I was looking for was a small, subtle addition to the options I had for computing. My cell phones with their killer combination of network access, local storage, and really nice screens got rid of a lot of the reason that I would have a laptop. But still, there was nothing better for me for making creative projects come to life. But here we get into the problem. I'm tough on everything that I touch. When I use keyboards, I smash them. When I get distracted, I throw things to the side. 
I put things in with other things that I usually forget don't go well together in the pocket of a knapsack or in my own pocket. So a laptop, in many ways, is being subjected to some of the worst stresses in the process of being my partner. And it began to show on this lovely little machine over the years. Keycaps on the keyboard started losing their words, becoming warped silver boxes, especially if they had the bad luck to be shift or caps lock. The screws in the back of this machine, which had tolerances that were incredibly tiny, started to pop out. I found that the back of this laptop was starting to become undone. And then the batteries started to die. This machine stopped being truly portable. It needed to be plugged into the wall. And if it wasn't, well, within about 60 seconds, it would start to power down. I moved past these inconveniences as one adjusts to an aging pet, helping them outside, lifting them up onto the bed, dealing with them because you don't really see a world without them. I didn't think of my laptop as a mere burnt-out part that I needed to replace. It had been there for me, almost ten years, and I was going to keep it to the very end. Over the last few months of its life, it occasionally wouldn't boot up. I mean, I would power it, it would start to run, and it would say it couldn't find a file, it couldn't find some sort of drive, and it wasn't going to be able to boot. A quick power cycle, and suddenly it started working again. That should have been my sign, and I took it seriously enough to get everything off the laptop, at least one copy of various podcast episodes, large recordings, and of course, every slide I'd made for any presentation. I had a philosophy, which maybe was more of an aspirational dream than anything else, that in an ideal world, you should be able to take your laptop, throw it into a fire, into a lake, and not lose any of the data that was on it in any meaningful way. You might have a mirroring service or use the laptop in a way that you don't trust leaving anything on it overnight. How well this happened? Well, in this particular case, I was lucky enough that just a few days earlier, I had transferred every podcast episode I had done, every WAV file version, off into the Internet Archive. But the moment came quickly and intensely. Taking the laptop to a school where I was giving a presentation, I wasn't able to get it to boot up. It gave me those same old errors, the file system not working, pressing a button for recovery, and yet nothing, nothing was working. In desperation, I put a setting on it, switching from the special Windows boot up into a legacy boot up. That turned out to be incredibly informative and also a huge mistake. Once you go into legacy on this particular model, you can never go back. You have to literally boot up an external CD, log on to this machine, change the BIOS and the RAM settings so that it will go back to the form that will function. So there I was, stuck. And that mode gave me a huge insight into something I didn't quite understand. The machine had not one, but two drives. Two equally sized 250 gigabyte drives, SSDs, inside of it. But they weren't mirrored. They weren't two different copies of the data presented on different drives to get around transient and other errors. No, it was a RAID 0 configuration. RAID 0? That meant that the data was striped between two completely different physical drives. This had two advantages and one massive disadvantage. The two main advantages were that you were able to use smaller drives and push them together and make what looked like a big one. And the striping meant that it would run faster because then the machine could pull from two different sources and increase the read speed beyond any singular drive's capability. But the big problem was that you were doubling your chances of losing everything. 
It turned out that this drive had been quietly dying, and in doing so, half the data wasn't there some of the time. The machine was recovering, but not really making clear that this was what was going on. So, one of the two drives had finally, utterly, failed. No evidence that it's ever going to come back. And with it, it's taken the entire laptop. The patient is terminal. It's over. Even if I recover anything, and I'll try, even if just for the fun of it and the experience, I can never, ever trust my little laptop ever again. Our journey will come to an end. It's a strange emotional moment to think of a tool worn by your own hands, who has stood by you through all sorts of travel, all sorts of trips, pointed to while I would explain something with excitement to people around me, or suddenly being hooked up to a screen to prove a point, or for me working on something creative, bashing my head against trying to come out with the idea and make it well edited. All those moments lost by the death of a solid-state drive, functioning in tandem, a special dance with a model just like it, inside of a roughly handled, ever-jostled, slowly dying white square. I commend it for its service, I take appreciation in the moments we had, and I sincerely doubt, unlike the drive itself, that I will ever, ever forget it. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Emilio Oliveira, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Craig Talbert, Dileep Reddy, Sean Kelly, Trixie the Cat, John Sturm, Eugene, Martin, Sembiance, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. For one month, I've been in Vienna as an artist-in-residence at the Museum Quarter, and they've given me a room to record my podcast, where I probably sound a little bit different. And I'm recording this on the replacement machine for my lost laptop. It's a Surface Pro touchpad, which was meant to do some basic work in spam checking, writing, and trivial tasks. But it's found itself at the center of my life, with a new Bluetooth keyboard, Bluetooth mouse, and a microphone connected to it through a USB hub through which I'm recording and editing and publishing my podcasts. My workflow is mostly the same, but it's going to take a little bit of time to make it flow as smoothly as the machine I used for the first four years. That's what happens. And already, I have found it charming to have something so self-contained inside of a little tough case that I bought for it, and treating it as a very large mobile phone with all of these wires running out of it, speaking, as I do, into a microphone while watching the waves go by. Here's to the life ahead of you, little Surface Pro. I hope it's not too rough.